it's an honor and my pleasure to introduce Dr. Yulia Paskinovsky. Dr. Paskinovsky is an assistant professor of economics at Wayne State University. Prior to joining Wayne State University, she was a Swan Fellow at the Center for Population and Development Studies at Harvard University. Her research interests are in labor, aging, and health with a focus on economics of caregiving. She was awarded her PhD in public policy at the Duke University. Dr. Traskinovsky, welcome. And uh, here's a complimentary mug oh. from the ISR. This isn't the one of the ones that you get when you find a mistake. In, uh, if I'm, if I'm, so, now. so there's still another mug to strive for after this. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Uh, thank you, Maso, for that wonderful um, introduction. Thank, I, let's see. Maybe I can do this. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for having me. Um, I've told some of you this already, but I did my undergrad here at the University of Minnesota in the French department, so over on the other side of campus. Um, but it's very it's very nice to be back. I love coming back here, and I love the weather. It's great, terrific weather here, as always. Um, so. Uh, I was trained as an economist and I'm in an econ department. So my preferred seminar style is combat. I understand that that's not the norm everywhere, uh, but just please feel free to interrupt me at any point if you have any questions or comments. Um, and then I will, of course, uh, leave plenty of time at the end. So, you know, whatever, whatever you feel comfortable with. Okay, so. Uh, this project is about caregiving and, and labor supply, uh, and I managed to, I'll tell you a little bit about, about the data, my data struggles, since we're in a data place, you guys can, can appreciate that, um, but we finally got to a point where it is now evidence from administrative data. It did not start out as evidence from administrative data, but we finally got there. Uh, thanks in no small part to my co-author, Matt Missel, who is at the Social Security Administration, um, and my co-author, Nicole Mestis. Okay, so um, let's see. Is this one? Okay. That's okay. We go like... Okay, no, that's fine. Okay. Oh, here we go. Yes, okay. Uh, Standard disclaimer, we are grateful for the to the SSA for funding our work. They are not responsible for anything that I say here today. Okay, so this is not gonna be news uh, to anybody in this room and I probably don't have to work very hard to convince you that uh, long-term care is something that we should all be thinking about. Uh, the growing need for this kind of care is a reality of a rapidly aging population in the US by 2030, one out of every five. Uh, people will be 65 and older. And, you know, when I started kind of thinking about this, 2030 seemed very, very far away, but it's actually not at all far away. Um, and the reason that, that that's really important is that about 70% of people turning 65 will need some kind of assistance with basic functioning in their lifetime. Um, and so this is sort of broadly what we call long-term care. So this is any kind of care or support uh, to somebody with physical or cognitive limitations that allows them to maintain a quality of life. This is distinct from acute medical care, which is an intervention when somebody's having a heart attack or a stroke or you know, needs to go to the doctor for a checkup. Um, you know, this includes things like helping somebody get in and out of bed, bathe, get dressed and eat, but also kind of chores, household um, activities, uh, going shopping, taking medication, managing their money. These are all uh, tasks that people need help with that are fall under the umbrella of long-term care. And now all of these uh, services can be provided formally, uh, but formal care uh, is extremely expensive. So I think we commonly think of nursing homes, um, these can range from about, I think on average, $90,000 a year. I think that's a slightly old number. I think on average, it's even more expensive these days. Um, you can have, of course, somebody come and uh, provide care inside your home that you pay, but this is also quite expensive. And in part because of the cost, but also because of preferences and, and, and a lot of other factors, uh, the majority or more than half of long-term care is provided 
informally by family members, most commonly spouses or adult children of older adults who need care. Um, the majority of these caregivers also work. And if you've ever tried to uh, work and, and care for somebody at the same time, you know that those activities are not necessarily always compatible. I know that the pandemic certainly made that uh, very clear early on uh, to people that it's hard to take care of somebody and work at the same time. And um, I think we have a lot of uh, qualitative, or I should say anecdotal evidence of um, kind of how this is difficult for people, um, even dating from before COVID, but certainly in the context of COVID, there's been a lot of media attention to these instances where people have had to maybe quit their jobs in order to provide care. Um, we also have empirical evidence, both qualitative and quantitative, that, that supports the fact that caring for family affects labor supply on the intensive and extensive margin. So if you need to care for somebody, you're less likely to work or you're working uh, fewer hours. Um, but we know that the reverse is also true, right? So economic opportunities, whether or not you have a job impact the likelihood that you are going to take on a caregiving role. And it's that back and forth that makes studying this question challenging. Um, we know we don't know what happens first often. Um, but I'm not really interested in trying to tease out that pathway uh, today. What I'm interested in is kind of taking a step back and thinking a little bit more holistically about what happens to labor supply around the time when somebody becomes a caregiver. So how rapidly do people who take on caregiving roles leave work uh, or see earnings decreases, right? Does their labor supply ever recover? And then do future caregivers appear to anticipate, right, or look forward to caregiving, um, caregiving roles? You know, or can we see that there are precipitating labor supply shocks or some sorts of change in work behavior that happens even before somebody takes on a caregiving role? And in order to do that, um, we're going to need to build some some complicated some some uh, some data that uh, piece together some data. So the objective here. Uh, is to describe the life cycle labor supply of family caregivers, and then to kind of get some estimates of the impact of starting caregiving on that trajectory. Um, in order to do that, uh, we're going to build a data set combining um, caregiving outcomes from the survey of income and program participation, so survey-based caregiving, with administrative uh, longitudinal data on labor supply, um, earnings, and employment outcomes specifically, and that's going to come from the Social Security administrative earnings data. Because we are here, uh, where um, you know, and you guys are all all data people, I will say that I started this project looking at the time use survey and trying to link it longitudinally to the CPS panel, uh, but that didn't go super well. And so then my next attempt was to use the time use survey and link it to SSA uh, earnings records, but SSA would not let me do that. So here we are, SIP, um, SSA. Okay, so once we have this data, which I'm going to tell you a little bit more about in a, in a couple of slides, um, I'm going to look at, estimate these dynamic trajectories of earnings before and after somebody becomes a caregiver. And then I'm gonna build two comparison groups in order to create some counterfactual trajectories to see if these caregivers are actually behaving kind of differently or if their labor supply looks different from the rest of the population. So I'm gonna match these guys to non-caregivers who look very, very similar demographically. And then I'm gonna try an approach which I'm gonna give you a lot more details on in a couple or towards the end of the talk where I'm kind of trying to leverage the variation and the timing of when somebody becomes a caregiver to try to build some counterfactual trends that are, that are plausible. Okay, so let me tell you about, about the data. 
So the survey of income and program participation is a longitudinal survey that focuses on about 40,000 households per panel. These uh, households are interviewed once every four to six months, sorry, once every four months approximately from between uh, four, between four and six years. I'm going to focus on the 96, 2001, 2004, and 2008 panels, and that is because these are the panels where they actually ask uh, questions about uh, family caregiving. Um, so it is a longitudinal survey, but they ask um, questions about labor supply, earnings, program participation, and there's a number of topical modules that are only asked once per panel. So these are cross-sectional. And about two years into each panel, we have one such cross-sectional module that happens to ask about informal care. So I have, even though the SIP is longitudinal, I really only have cross-sectional information about caregiving. Okay, but we can link the um, SIP to the Social Security uh, Administrative uh, Detailed Earnings Records, and that gives me a very long longitudinal panel of earnings um, and of annual earnings and, and labor supply. Okay. That still doesn't fix the problem of the fact that I only have cross-sectional caregiving information. Right. So I'm going to leverage the way that the survey mod survey is asked in order to try to build a caregiving panel. So the question in the SIP is, um, there are situations in which people provide regular unpaid care or assistance to a family member or a friend who has a long-term illness or a disability. During the past month, did you provide such care or assistance to a family member or a friend living here or living elsewhere? And about 5% of SIP respondents uh, self-identify in this way as a caregiver, they say yes. Um, now this is, again, because you guys all, I will, you will indulge my, my data focus on this. So in the time use survey, the question, there is a very similar question in the elder care module, but it's phrased somewhat differently. And as a result, about 20%, I think it's actually 17.3% of the American time use survey respondents say self-identify as a caregiver. So this is a much lower number than, um, and the time periods are a little bit different, but not so different that we would expect like three times more caregivers. And so I think that this question is particularly restrictive in, in the way that it's um, asked because they ask specifically about long-term illness or disability. Time use survey does not ask that, does not have that level of specificity. The look back period here is one month, whereas in the time you survey, the look back period is three months. So that could also cause some differences. I'm highlighting this because people self-identify here. They're selecting into this caregiving kind of in self-identifying as a caregiver. And I, I think that's going to impact what I find. So I just want to kind of, I'm going to come back to it. So I want to, I want to flag this here. Yes. Denominator as time use survey. Oh, can you repeat that for the I'll repeat. Yes, not being familiar with either the time use or the SIPP surveys, we're still finding this gap. But is this despite them having the same denominator? So that's a very good question. Um, it should be very similar. Um, I think yes. So because I limit, I limit the, I'm limiting these guys to everybody 15 and, and older. And I think the time use is roughly that. Um, and uh, the SIP does over, so, so this is weighted, you know, the, 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 the estimate in the, in the, time, in the um, time use survey is also weighted to be population representative. You know, I think the SIP oversamples um, certain groups of people, but, but the weights should, should take care of that. So roughly, yes. Yes. Um, I, uh, I have when I see reports that Yes. So we only, so then we only have retrospective information. Do you only have retrospective information on people who, at the time of the survey, are caregivers? Exactly. So if someone was caregiving before, mm -hmm. but um, or not doing it at the time of the survey, they're missed from these previous exactly. numbers. Exactly. Yes. Absolutely. That's absolutely right. Yes. So we only can highlight, can tag people who are currently actively caregivers, and then they are asked 
this retrospective information about when did they start providing this care. Um, and so about 22% started caring in the last year, 12.7%. Uh, so they start caregiving a year ago. We have about 15% say two years ago. And then the majority of the sample has been a long time caregiver. They've been caregiving for three or more years. Um, that is, it's that this distribution is actually very similar. So the time use also has this kind of question. This is this distribution is really, really similar to what you find in the time use. Um, there are some kind of statistical properties about length bias sampling, which I'm happy to get into in the question and answer session if you want about why this you know this distribution looks like this. But um, so using this retrospective information, I'm going to backdate. Oops. Okay, yes, so I'm gonna use this retrospective information. I'm gonna tell you exactly how in a minute. I'm gonna use this retrospective information to uh, create essentially a longitudinal panel where I can see people before they started caregiving and then after they started caregiving. Um, so in terms of what the sample of caregivers look like, um, this is the, this, these are the, the caregivers in the sample and then um, I have it broken down by male and female. Um, but about, as I said, 5% of the sample is a caregiver. Um, and then they also ask who they're caring for. So I can break it down into recipients. Um, you'll notice that a quarter of these folks are caring for a child. So um, I have been dropping children from the sample because I think that caregiving for children has probably, um, you know, and these are children with an illness or a disability. But you know, I I have I tend to think that that probably has a different kind of dynamic process than caregiving for older family members. So I've been dropping um, children, but I'm working on some analyses right now to bring them back in because I've gotten some some pushback on those assumptions. Um, so this distribution is again also fairly similar to what you see in the American Time Use Survey. In particular, a lot of people say they're caring for a non-relative. Um, this is kind of a catch-all phrase, like there's a couple of other, there's, there's an, uh, an other category or an unidentified category in there, so it could be that the relationship is not well, I was not able to be well identified um, in the SIP, but, you know, I was also surprised by kind of how much of this caregiving is not either for spouses or, or parents and, and in-laws. Um, so I'm going to focus on adults who have been caring for non-children. Uh, and they've been doing this work for, or say that they've been caring for two or years or less. Um, and there I get about a sample of about 5,000 or so individuals. Um, and they've been caring for, you know, they spend about 10 hours a week on caregiving, caring for slightly more than, um, you know, between one and two adults. And about 70% of this care goes um, outside of the household. Um, you'll notice that men and women have somewhat different um, patterns in, in terms of who they're caring for, but in terms of kind of intensity and what they're doing, you know, it, they're not dramatically different um, in terms of their caregiving. And this is true if you look at exactly what they're doing, breaking it down in terms of IDL, IADLs, ADLs, medical care. It looks, it looks fairly similar. Um, okay, so as I said, adults caring for adults for two years or less from each SIP panel. Um, I'm going to use that retro, retrospective information to backdate the year in which caregiving starts. Um, gives me about five, just over 5,000 observation, observations. Um, now the limitations, yes. No problem. Yes. So the three plus year people are gone now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so everybody... Here, all these guys are gone. So I okay. left with under half the sample. Okay, so the long-term caregivers are gone. And by design, most of the short-term caregivers are gone because you have to have been giving care in the last month. So if I cared for my father for three months last year. Yeah, you're not in I'm here. gone. So you've really got them. You, you've truncated on both ends of the distribution long-term like somebody who had to care for their parents for five years is gone yes yes as is probably the vast majority of short-term caregivers 
Well, the short-term caregivers that I don't see, that's not a decision on my part. That's I, I know, simply, yeah, yeah, but, but you know, analytically. Yes. Analytically, yes. I mean, uh, so presumably the timing of the survey with respect to the care spell should be random. So, you know, so it should kind of be, you know, it shouldn't be uh, systematically truncated on the short end. So that wouldn't necessarily introduce any bias. Um, you know, the, the long-term caregivers, you know, they were, because I ended, I started with slightly, sh with shorter panels, I was just simply mechanically wasn't able to see uh, what was happening multiple years, you know, more years ago. I'm worried a little bit about recall bias. I'm worried a little bit about like bias sampling. And, you know, so I, I'm sort of trying to, trying to construct what I think of as a more tractable set of people who I think are kind of similar. If you look at the statistics, the longer term caregivers look quite different than the than the the shorter. The, so people who have been caring for three or more years are, look quite different than than these guys. So in some sense, it kind of gives me a, a sample of people that I that I think are roughly similar. Okay, I I, I guess I need to hear more about why losing most of the short term caregivers, not by your choice, but by yes. design isn't consequential. Um, because presumably you're gonna compare, you're gonna construct a comparison group. Mm -hmm. And it could be that there are many caregivers in the comparison, short-term caregivers. Recent caregivers, comparison. yeah. Yes, that's absolutely true. Um, I think that if anything, that would bias me to finding null results because there's some contamination. Um, and I think, uh, you know, Yes, that that's a bias. I think biasing towards null is is at least feels safer. I don't know if that, uh, than than biasing in the in the other direction. But yes, you know, I I can't tell if in my control group anybody is has recently been a caregiver. I do have a second control group that doesn't include potential caregivers. Um, so uh, maybe that'll that'll uh, that'll help a little bit once we get there. Mm -hmm. Five and eight yeah. Folks. Yeah. Is is painful to see them leave. Okay. Um, I wonder if you've thought about and and I I think the issue is that 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 plus could be anything, right? Mm -hmm. So identifying when it happened, you can't do from their responses. I wonder if you've thought about using the the other folks and the patterns of their labor force participation to try to then predict when you know when is there a discontinuity mm -hmm. in their uh, that could tell you or help you infer a, a a departure. Yeah, I had not thought about that, but that's that's interesting. I think kind of trying to map out, um, you know, trying to map out what these trajectories look like. What we're missing, of course, is like the longitudinal caregiving behavior, right? Like the thing is that these spells could last. 20 years or they could last five years. And 20 year spells and five year spells of caregiving are very different, right? These spells by definition, right, last at least three years, right? So while here I have short and long-term caregivers, here I only have long-term caregivers. And so it's hard, yeah, it's, 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 it hasn't, I haven't gotten there yet, but something to think about for sure. All right. Okay. So, um, so then once I have kind of this, 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 uh, caregiving panel, I'm also then going to match them to their, um, SSA, uh, records. And so here I have a very long panel where I'm seeing uh, balanced annual outcomes because the timing is, is, is different for everybody for about 16 years before and nine years after a purported, the purported start of a caregiving spell. Okay, um, I'm going to uh, not spend time on these demographic characteristics, except to say that caregivers are more likely to be female and then otherwise look actually fairly similar to non-caregivers um, in the SIP. They're a little bit less likely to work, but still the majority of them are working. Okay, so 
Uh, once we've spent all this time and asked all these people to help us put this data together, what is what do we actually get for it? So what is the life cycle labor supply of family caregivers look like? Okay, so on the left here, I'm mapping annual earnings for the full caregiver sample. Um, the horizontal axis here is event time relative to the start of a caregiving spell. So zero is the year that I've dated the start of their caregiving spell, minus 15 is 15 years before, and then plus 10 is, is 10 years after. Uh, that vertical line is at year minus one. Um, and then this is dollars on the on the vertical uh, axis. And I have not adjusted this for anything at all. So, you know, you're looking at this and you're like, all right, so what, what this is a bunch of different caregivers. There are a bunch of different ages. When they start caregiving, we're like collapsing actually a lot of life course dynamics here in terms of what we expect the age profile to look like. So just to anchor you a little bit, um, they're on average 51 when they start, or the year before they start caregiving. They're about 60, right, about nine years later, and they're 35 on average, right, when we first see them. But now, of course, as I said, we're, there's a lot of different ages and a lot of, a lot of different profiles in here, and I'm not, I'm not adjusting for anything. Okay. So you can see that, that there seems to be kind of an increase in earnings over time, which is what we would expect, and then a decrease, and it's maybe like there's a bit of a discontinuity right around the time that caregiving starts, but it's a little bit hard to see what's going on. So, you know, we need to compare this to somebody. What are the counterfactual, what should the counterfactual trends here look like? And so the comparison, the first comparison group just as a first approach is just all of the non-caregivers in the SIP. And hopefully you can see the very faint gray line, which is all the non-caregivers in the SIP. And at age 35, they look very similar to the caregivers, but you can quickly see that caregivers uh, look different in terms of their earnings um, well before they start caregiving and, and certainly well after. Um, but you know, we saw that caregivers are different ages in different gender composition, and generally we think they're probably different than non-caregivers. Um, so the second comparison group that we construct tries to match on some observable characteristics. So we match uh, exactly on age in five-year bins because the SIP is not large enough for, for me to go coarser, that finer than that. Uh, a two a binary education variable, gender. And then because we have this very long panel, we also match on earnings trajectories in the first four years. So I, uh, that shaded panel there is the, is, is the first four years that I observed somebody in this panel. And so I'm matching on earnings in, and labor supply in those first four years, along with uh, these demographic characteristics. And you can see that um, even though we only matched on those first four years, uh, the trajectories look quite similar after, afterwards. So we do a fairly good job of matching these guys on earnings trajectories over uh, pretty much the full pre-caregiving period. Um, and then here you can see somewhat more clearly that there is a discrete or a more discrete decrease in earnings in the year that caregiving begins, as distinct from this match group of non-caregivers who, of course, could have been caregiving, you know, somewhere in here or could be caregiving somewhere in here, um, but but to the to the extent that I can observe, are not caregivers, uh, but look very similar to caregivers. And you can see that th so there's a difference that opens up right around the time that caregiving starts. So as earnings. We do the same thing with just a binary variable of, are you working? You can see this uh, discrete uh, change a little bit more clearly. So there's something that's happening in terms of both earnings and labor supply right around the time that somebody self-identifies as a caregiver, right, relative to even a very closely matched comparison group. So uh, the next thing we do is we're gonna look at this by gender. So I'm just gonna split this by men and women and I 
Um, so women are stacked. I'm sort of reorienting you here. Women are stacked, so earnings and employment, and then men earnings um, and employment. And um, I've made the scales so that they're comparable across gender, which means that we sacrifice a little bit. The, the differences aren't, aren't quite as dramatic as they are if you, if you zoom in. But um, so a couple of things to notice um, in terms of both earnings and employment. So women's trajectories are very similar to their matched comparison group. And I have the non uh, non-matched non-caregivers again in that same gray line. Um, and for women, you know, we're able to match them really, really well right up until the year uh, that caregiving starts. And there you can see that uh, discrete break. There's a change in, in both earnings, slightly bigger change in labor supply, but it kind of comes back uh, to what the matched count their match counterparts are doing. Um, Right, it looks like women's labor supply recovers. When we looked at men, however, their trajectories look quite different, right? So we are not really able to do a good job matching men after, so remember years, these four years, I'm mechanically matching them to be similar, right? And as soon, right, as those four years are up, men's trajectories falls off. So um, the change in, in their labor supply in terms of the trend happens well before they start caregiving, and it doesn't really look like there's much of a discrete change, a little bit, but certainly not as clear as for women right around the time that that caregiving spell starts, and men don't appear to recover quickly, if ever, right? So this downward trajectory starts well before the spell starts, and if ever, if it ever ends, and well after this uh, spell starts. Um, so the other thing that we can do is break this down by age. And so it gets very, very messy because we have uh, two outcomes, uh, two genders, and then I'm going to bring in three different age groups. So I'm going to show you just the results for women first, broken down by age categories. And I will admit to have selecting these somewhat on an ad hoc basis. So 62 is early retirement. So that was kind of the logic for, for picking 62. And then we've got people in their 40s and people in their 50s. Um, and you can see kind of very clear patterns for, for younger women in terms of earnings and employments. Um, things get a little bit murkier once we start looking at the older women. Um, or women who start caregiving uh, at older ages, you see a more of a discrete drop here, but you know the trends seem to be a little bit off. So the other thing that's happening is, if you remember, I started out with 5,000 observations. The more finely we cut this data, the less precision we have. So um, my takeaway is it's, it's hard to learn anything really about, about these age is age gradients, um, except for that women track, right, fairly closely to their match counterparts. Um, for men at all ages, the story is very similar, or at least pre before 62, right, you see this kind of peeling away from their matched trends well before the start of a caregiving spell. It looks like something is happening to men's labor supply well before they start caregiving. So, you know, our, our takeaway here is that while women are going to take on a caregiving role when that role comes up, regardless of what's happening, men are experiencing these precipitating labor supply shocks. So, you know, they're less likely to work, their earnings are lower, right? The opportunity cost of time for them is lower, and then they take on a caregiving role. Now, there's many other ways to also interpret these data, but that's my takeaway. Um, and I'm very interested in to hear what, what you guys think. Yes, please. Um, when I look at these, I think to myself, oh gosh, it doesn't really look like it matters that much. It doesn't look like a very big effect. So can you just give a sense of like, I don't, I don't know if there's an effect, there's not exactly an effect size, but this doesn't look like, it's, I just thought it would look a lot different. 
and there'd be much wider discrepancies between um, for the men and for the women. So I'm just surprised that it's not bigger. Mm -hmm. Um, so the effect sizes are not very big and I, I do, I will calculate some, I will give you some actual numbers for magnitudes here in a minute. Um, you know, they're on the order of, of two or two or three percent. That is fairly consistent with other U.S. based studies that kind of do a more causal, uh, setup and really try to, to estimate, um, you know, a lot of these, you know, a lot of caregivers kind of continue continue to work. And I think kind of why and how and who those caregivers are that continue to work and kind of what kind of jobs they have that allow them to continue to work, you know, is, is certainly a really interesting kind of question. Um, you know, also average caregiving here is, you know, was 10 hours a week. Um, so, you know, are we picking up you know, people who are going from zero to 40 hours of care every week, you know, a lot of these guys are probably, you know, are maybe doing five or six hours on the weekends, you know, some, something, something that is, that is more compatible kind of with work. So, so I think care, you know, if you think about kind of caregiving intensity, this is sort of an intent to treat kind of, you know, broad group of people here that we're thinking about. So the, the effect is small. It's consistent with what, with what, um, what exists in other data, but also you kind of have to, you know, think about who the who the group is that you know we're averaging over. Yep. Um, earlier, um, earlier you mentioned that uh, looking at anticipatory behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, could you describe like when that would happen and where would I see that in the? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I don't know the answer to. I think like uh, we don't have a clear sense. I mean, I, I think that it's possible. You know, the the, the logic for thinking about anticipatory uh, and kind of anticipatory behavior is that, you know, in the in the in the child care penalty literature, the child penalty you know, maternal labor supply literature, you know, people there there used to be kind of a bigger anticipation effect where women made decisions about education and labor supply because they anticipated having children. And so, you know, one kind of thing that that I thought might be might happen or, you know, that I thought would be interesting is do people kind of make decisions later in life anticipating, you know, that their parent might need care or their spouse might need care. And I think, I mean, my takeaway is I don't really see, you know, I don't think these are anticipation effects, right? I wouldn't consider something that happens 10 years ahead of time an anticipation effect. I would think maybe it's a precipitating, you know, labor supply shock unrelated to caregiving. Um, you know, in terms of the women, and I'm going to just go here so that we can see, you know, we don't really see much in terms of, of anticipation effects. So, um, you know, I think maybe, uh, maybe I put a little too much emphasis on, we will see anticipation effects when actually um, we don't, but, but it started out with a hypothesis of, of would we expect to see um, anticipation effects? And I'm not sure kind of, you know, from a, from a, a theoretical standpoint, I don't, you know, I don't really know. So would you be saying that like, you're kind of catching a bit more of the men um, are shocked a bit, they're, they're much more susceptible to shocks than? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if shock is the right word, but I, that I keep using, um, but um, so, I mean, something is clearly happening, right, where they're on a different trajectory and we can't match them, right? The women we can match, the men we can't really match. So there's, there's, there's turn, you know, it, maybe it's turn, maybe it's dynamics that, that are, you know, very not, you know, that are, that are not similar, but it certainly looks like they're leaving the labor force, right? Or they're, something is happening to their labor supply well before they initiate caregiving. Yep. Um, I, I'm, I'm stuck on it. Back to the shocked comment. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, I, you were pretty careful not to use causal language. Yes. Um, and, but, but he, so far there's been, I guess a couple of people have interpreted in causal terms and I think that's the natural thing to do. The, the thing that's, that I'm struggling with is the imperfection of the matching. Um, the shock 
isn't random, right? So if I, I I'm more likely to have uh, uh, an older relative who needs care if I am lower socioeconomic status, if I smoke, if I live in, you know, if I have a terrible diet, if, and those things run in family. Right? Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't, if I could look ahead and say, this person is going to have a, well, do you know where I'm going? Like there, I see where you're going. The inability, and I know you can't control for all those things. Yeah, um, I see where. It make a dramatic difference when you control for what you control for. But if you could control for. So just to be clear, I'm not controlling for anything here at all. Uh, you are it, when you adjust the comparison group. Oh, the, yes, yeah, yeah. yes. I'm, um, but yes. But uh, another comparison group that further equated the two groups with respect to health risk behaviors, um, uh, dietary things, you know, mm -hmm. I think you would see even less of a difference. So okay, so let me yeah. jump ahead. If in my, in, I have five minutes, let me jump ahead and sure. I'll show you my regression results, which have individual fixed effects in there, which might alleviate some, but not certainly not all of, of, of those concerns. Um, one kind of uh, response off, off, you know, just into what you said is, I, I agree with you at the same time, the difference between men and women is still striking to me. Like, I'm not sure that I can tell a story where, you know, the me those mechanisms would be true for men, but very much not true for women. Um, but, uh, you know, let me just, let me show you the regression results and then, yeah. Okay, I'd, I'd love to hear it. Um, okay, so uh, the empirical approach, all we're doing is we're just putting this in, a, in an event study framework. I'm controlling for uh, year fixed effects, um, individual fixed effects, and um, sorry, individual fixed effects, calendar time fixed effects, and age fixed effects. Um, and I'm gonna report um, indicators for event time um, that are just going to be basically the difference between that matched control group and, and the treatment group that I, uh, that I showed you. And so the treated group here is the caregivers. Um, and so the coefficient here is going to describe the evolution of outcomes across event time. So between 16 years before and nine years after between the caregiver um, and the comparison group. Um, and, and this is going to, um, so depending on how I select the group, it's going to depend, uh, this is this coefficient and how we interpret it is going to depend on how I select the group. So the match comparison group um, is first. I told you about the matching. And so here the counterfactual is going to take into account, um, you know, is going to include, right, the trajectory is going to include these kind of precipitating or anticipatory uh, if there are any effects. So here's what the event studies look like. Again, this is where I control for additionally individual fixed effects, um, calendar time, and, and age more precisely. Um, and I'll just uh, skip ahead to where I show you also the numbers. So here is a kind of a way to think about, you know, if we were to interpret these effects, what, what do they look like um, magnitude wise? And they're not very large, right? So they're, again, on the order of two, three percentage points. Um, you know, and for women, we can, again, this trend looks very, very similar before, before caregiving starts. These pre-trends are relatively flat. You know, there's a little bit of noise and then we see this dip. Um, for men, you know, it's, it's much harder to argue, even though they're not precisely estimated that these pre-trends are, that these um, pre-trends are, are flat. So, you know, even when I adjust for everything, it looks like male caregivers are sort of you know, deviating off this uh, pre-trend well before they start caregiving, especially um, clear in earnings um, and not really returning back to their pre-trend very quickly. Um, so the second comparison group that the goal is to kind of address some of these concerns is instead of thinking about non-caregivers who look similar to caregivers, I'm going to think about people. I'm going to use variation in the timing of when this caregiving spell starts to use future caregivers, right? So to the extent that we think that the um, that the labor supply of future that that the onset of caregiving might be random within a certain amount of time, right? Future caregivers might be a good control group for current caregivers, and this should, in some sense, take care 
of some of that selection issue because we're only looking at people who will eventually become caregivers in the control group. Um, and also, you know, to the extent that we think that there are any precipitating trends and they are smooth, um, this, this should take care of, of some of that. And, and so the question here is what happens when somebody who will at some point become a caregiver actually, uh, what happens to their earnings when they actually start caregiving, right? Versus sort of thinking about all of the selection into caregiving. Um, and so uh, we define we define the uh, the treatment group here again as using future caregivers. I'm happy to to talk more uh, about that, but again, in the interest of time, I'm going to um, skip past it and um, just show you the event studies. Which and here I apologize, I've inverted. So now women are across the top with earnings and employment, and men are across the bottom here. And so you can see kind of very similar patterns to what we saw in the first uh, when we used the first comparison group. So this discrete change for women, it's not quite as large here in both earnings and employment, and men's kind of men's behavior is, is a little bit all over the place. So even relative to future caregivers, right, you can see kind of these trends that are changing well before uh, the start of a caregiving spell. Okay, so just to, to very briefly conclude, you know, we think that what we, what we can take away from this is that the life cycle labor supply of caregivers is gonna vary by age and gender. I did not show you education. Um, it's, it's in the paper. So impacts for women appear to be concentrated um, in the first two years of, of starting a care spell. The effects are not huge, um, but, but they're there. And um, caregiving appears to be uh, one part of a long downward trajectory for men. Um, we saw evidence of, of something happening to labor supply in the 10 years before caregiving starts. Um, so as, as, as we've pointed out, you know, these are not causal estimates. I don't have a clean design here. Can't tell you what is the effect of caregiving on labor supply. But uh, what we lose in this strictly causal interpretation, I think we gain in kind of being able to highlight these dynamic relationships between caregiving employment and employment over a long period of time. Um, and the things that are happening before somebody starts caregiving, um, I think are important if we want to think about how to calculate the overall cost, but think about who's selecting um, into caregiving um, and how, how, uh, how all these things relate across the life course. Um, we, you know, we're using self-identified caregivers, which uh, we've noted kind of the various problems with using these methods. Um, you know, I think self-identified caregivers are certainly a policy relevant group from the perspective of paid leave and other benefits, for example, right? You need to self-identify as a caregiver in order to get kind of access to, to benefits. And so if we learn at what point in the labor supply kind of life cycle, does somebody self-identify as a caregiver and who does it is, is certainly, I think, uh, a really meaningful outcome. Um, Okay, and I will end there. So thank you very much uh, for, for your time and your questions, and I'm happy to answer or take more of your questions. Okay. Okay, first question from online is, what if you don't observe a caregiver 16 years before they start caregiving? Do you match them to a similarly censored non-caregiver? Presumably this issue affects a significant part of your sample. Yeah, so that's a great, uh, that's a great question. We, so for, we limit the sample to people who were 18 and older when the panel starts and the panel is balanced. So I see you can't, you have to be 18 or older 16 years before you start caregiving. So you have to be about, you, the, the lowest, the youngest age is about 30. That makes you about what, 36, 34, 
Okay, and then I'll ask the second online question is, how is this effect not just due to retirement? Well, the, everybody's starting at, at different ages. So um, uh, I, you know, I, I think that, let me, let me see if I, so people are just retiring at the moment that they become caregivers. Um, I mean, that it could be happening. They're leaving the labor supply. What's happening when they're leaving the labor supply? We have looked at retirement in the SSA and we don't see an uptick in retirement. Um, so it doesn't appear that those that that non-participation is is um, is retirement behavior. It's exit from the labor force for for various you know reasons. And those people are fifty five on average, so a lot of them can't or uh, technically don't aren't old enough to officially retire. Hello, thanks for the presentation. Uh, I have a question about the, uh, there's a larger uh, impact among men compared to women. Is that because uh, women, uh, the majority of uh, care work is done by women? Uh, and uh, do you have uh, uh, some data uh, for uh, people aged uh, from 20 to 30s? Because uh, that is the time when women start to uh, give birth and uh, do caregiving uh, responsibility. So do you have the, or, uh, and one more question is, how did you uh, treat uh, the uh, people who do uh, caregiving for their job, for example, domestic workers, uh, home health care? Uh, yep, so um, great questions. So we looked at, so I identify, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take them backwards. I identified caregivers using the survey question and the survey question specified unpaid. So certainly the people in my sample could also be professional caregivers. I think something like 1% of all occupations can be classified in like health care, home-based kind of healthcare. So certainly some of these people could be professional caregivers, but um, my kind of screening question specifically asks for unpaid. So if they are professional caregivers are also providing unpaid care um, to somebody. Um, in terms of younger caregivers, I, uh, so we don't, you know, for the, for the data reasons that I mentioned, we don't have um, uh, younger caregivers in here. So again, we're focused on kind of caregiving to older adults. The average age at which people like that kind of caregiving role begins is in the 50s. So I don't, I think we have many fewer um, people caregiving who are, who are in their 20s, but it is a phenomenon. And, you know, we have people who are caring for grandparents and certainly 18 year olds who are providing long-term care. So, you know, for the data limitations that I mentioned, um, I'm not including them, but that's not to say that they're not an important group that certainly we would expect to have potential labor supply um, impacts that, that, you know, would be lasting because they are well before. And as you said, you know, they are also probably, you know, more likely to be caring for children. So those roles overlap. Um, what, oh, sorry, what, can you add, remind me your first two questions? Mm, why are men? Yep. So, you know, again, I I wouldn't necessarily say that the effect of caregiving on men is larger than women. What we see is that women have, you know, are are we have we see this kind of relationship where women are less likely to work immediately upon taking on a caregiving role than than these matched groups. Men, you know, I can't say what the effect is. I mean, my takeaway, which we can you know discuss, is that. There doesn't seem really to be much of an effect. It's, you know, this is part of a trajectory that happens well before the caregiving role. So there's a selection process that's happening that I think is important to unpack. Um, but I don't, I wouldn't interpret this as the effect is larger for men. Um, and I think, you know, yes, men, more women do care work than men, but it's about 40, 60 in the sample. And, and that's consistent with, with kind of other data sets. And men and women in this sample are doing fairly similar care roles. So I think that men do provide care. Um, and actually, you know, I think we should 
pay more attention to men who are providing care and, and how they select into that and what they're doing. Um, because, you know, men have parents and men have spouses and, you know, they do do this work. So I think we need to pay more attention to them. I would think that has a lot to do with gender socialization and also gender composition of the children. Mm -hmm. So that to me was that I was going to kind of say what you just said is that it seems like there's a major selection effect for men and you're not seeing that as much for women. Mm -hmm. And it probably has to do with how many sisters do they have? And um, I don't know. I'm just thinking about, and are they more likely to be caring for a spouse than the women are more likely to be caring for a parent? And so I don't know if you have who they're caregiving for, but I'm assuming you don't. I do. Um, and I haven't split it up because again, the finer we cut the data, the noisier these results are where, I mean, we're bare, I barely have any observations kind of as it is. Um, I do have individual fixed effects in the models. So to the extent that, you know, that falls out of, you know, to the extent that I would add that as a control that's going to fall out of, of the models. Um, so I, so I, I haven't done the kind of stratifying um, I mean, I, I really look forward to a robust data set that has a lot of caregivers where we can like really answer these questions. Here you guys are at the heart of the beast. <laughs> look forward to it, you know, so. Hi, one more question along those lines. I'm wondering if something that can explain how the women versus the female versus mm -hmm. male pattern is that women regardless of if they end up being caretakers or not, kind of from the beginning, expect, like I feel like everyone's expecting, well, expects to become or, or arranges their career in a way um, that they might be care caretakers, whether or not um, they do it or don't. Mm -hmm. Well, for men, they weren't socialized into ever thinking of being caretakers. So then there's more of a selection effect of who, which men end up being caretakers. Sure. Um, so I think like maybe it may not show like so I think that might help explain why the women are better match the, the mm -hmm. control versus the match yep. versus the men yes like they were never expecting yes it. I so I I I mean I think that the selection effect is exactly what I'm interested in, right in in kind of trying to explain the mechanism like what is driving this selection effect. And, and so I think that, I think you're exactly right. I mean, we saw that the earnings between men and women was very, very different. Lab, you know, started baseline labor supply was very, very different between men and women. Um, you know, I think that the men, you know, for me, the selection effect is that the men who take on caregiving um, are, are, you know, are already less attached to the labor force, right? They have a lower opportunity cost of time. It's just, it's something that, you know, and this, I've done other work that looks at like business cycles and family caregiving. And we find that men very much respond to the business cycle. So when the unemployment rate is very high, men do much more care work than when on the unemployment rate is low. So those two things together kind of, you know, start to tell a story about that the selection effect is something about, you know, opportunities in the labor market men have you know men are if men are working and they're and they're you know their careers are stable and successful they're not going to take the time out right women are going to do this care work when it comes up you know for for these reasons so again i'm i look forward to hearing alternative uh alternative stories but that's kind of like this story that's been building in my head and it's exa i mean i wish i had a way to and if anybody has any ideas of like, how do I identify like that? Like, where do I look for to, to see that mechanism? Right? Like in the SIP, can I sort of figure out like, is there some metric for, for this that I can, you know, get in, in the survey data to kind of, you know, tell a more convincing story about what exactly this is, what is going on? I do. I do. I'm wondering if some power, I mean, I don't think you can see gender, but if you do, you can have couples. Married versus not married or something like that. Maybe you could look at the highest earner mm. of the couple mm -hmm. versus the lowest earner. Mm -hmm. And if you get rid of the gender, I mean, I don't yeah. know how much you can do. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, um, we, 
uh, I have a, a, a different project where we're using um, administrative data in Denmark, which is the magical land where all the data are linked together. And we have the universe of everybody. And so we're hoping in that context to be able to think about selection, you know, based on kind of what your spouse is doing and the number of children that you have and all of these dynamics, because there we kind of have the universe, we're close to the universe um, versus here where we're, you know, we're, we're working with kind of limited, very limited sample sizes. But I think, yeah, I think there's definitely some kind of dynamics um, that are going on. We are out of time. Please join me in thanking Yulia for this presentation. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for all your excellent questions.